Are you wondering if it's safe to travel to Baja in your camper van? Do you crave sunny beaches, cheap campsites, amazing food, and a winter playing in the crystal clear water of the Sea of Cortez? We travel to Baja every year on our sailboat and just love that part of the world. But I was curious just how different it is to travel by camper van. In this episode of the Wayward Home podcast, I interview a woman who did just that last year. And she's planning on making the trek to Baja again and staying even longer this time. Hopefully by the end of this episode, you'll be packing your bags and heading to Baja in your camper van too. Let's go. Welcome to the Wayward Home Podcast, all about van life, boat life, and nomadic living. We'll bring you tips, interviews, and stories from the road and on the water. Now, here's your host, Kristen Haynes. Hey there, I'm Kristen Haynes with thewaywardhome.com, and I spend half the year in my Sprinter van and half on my sailboat in Mexico, and I hope to inspire you to achieve your nomadic living dreams. So it is November, and it's getting close to that time of year when us boaters and van lifers start thinking about the sunny beaches and warm waters of Baja, California in Mexico. So we've traveled to Baja, but only on our sailboat. And van lifer Brooke Alexander, our guest today, goes in her camper van. Brooke has been living in her Dodge Promaster camper van since 2023, sorry, since 2020, and has also traveled extensively over the U.S. and through Baja. So she has some great tips and advice about exploring Baja in a camper van, and I'll talk about the sailboat side of it, and we'll talk about some differences between seeing Baja by land and by sea. So Brooke, I'm so excited you're here. Um, Thanks so much for joining the Wayward Home podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so great. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about Baja. I just love going there on my boat. I think it's such a special place because it has desert and ocean. I don't know any other place really like it. So when did you first go to Baja and what inspired you to go down there? So I first went to Baja, I guess it's technically still this year uh, because I went in January of 2023. Um, I spent three months there. Um, It had always been something I thought about when I moved into the van and just didn't know if I was going to be able to make it work. Um, But I, I found some seasoned Baja travelers and joined a caravan with them. So I kind of got to know the ropes. And now I'm planning my own trip this year. Oh, fantastic. And when you'd heard about Baja before and going in the van, we've only actually driven to Baja. We haven't even driven to Baja in a van, actually. We've driven to Puerto Penasco in a van. But I feel like the van experience is a little bit different than the boat. And you have some different concerns to worry about driving versus we're kind of really far removed from land and people. So what were some of your top kind of concerns at first about crossing the border and going to Baja? Yeah, I just in general get anxiety when I cross borders. I've always felt that way. Um, Even if I don't have anything to hide, it's just kind of a scary feeling. Um, And especially going into a country where I speak decent Spanish, um, but, you know, sometimes they might use words I'm not familiar with because I don't use an everyday language. So I was really nervous to cross the border. um, And that was actually very simple, uh, (laughs) depending on where you cross at. Um, they do a quick search of your van. Um, they, I think two officers came in my van, opened my cabinets, asked me a couple of questions, asked me if my dog would bite, um, and then said, go on your way. So it was much simpler than I expected. Um, the thing that kind of surprised me, I would say, is that there are checkpoints throughout Baja. So it's not just at the border. There are, I think, six military checkpoints in between um, where you cross at and Cabo. So it's kind of like you're crossing the border six times. <laughs> Yeah, we've also gone through those military checkpoints when we've driven to Puerto Penasco in Sonora, which is similar to Baja, in which I don't think you need an import um, permit for your vehicle to drive to Sonora or Baja, correct? You didn't need to do an import permit for your car, right? Correct. You just have to get your FMM card, um, which is quite confusing. Uh, there's not there's not really any clear signs on where you get that when you cross the border by land. So you kind of have to know ahead of time that you need to ask someone for it and figure out where to get it. Yeah, that's a, also a really good tip because we had a hard time finding the um, Immigration and Customs Office as well. And we've done um, two different border crossings and they're kind of in nondescript random buildings. So um, where did you cross and how did you figure out that office? Yeah, so I crossed through Tecate, which is actually a really small border crossing. Um, Mexicali and Tijuana are the big ones that a lot of people cross through. Tijuana is really close to San Diego. Um, but Tecate is, is where I crossed because uh, the group that I went with had crossed so many times and they said this is the best experience that they've had um, because it's so small. Um, I think we waited maybe five minutes to cross the border, whereas some of the bigger crossings, you might wait hours. Um, And so the FMM card was pretty difficult there, even though my friends had crossed there before, they still didn't really quite know where to find it. Um, And so we wound up kind of crossing 
parking and wandering around for a while. Um, I think we technically crossed back into the U.S. on foot <laughs> and then walked across the footbridge and and uh, got our FMM there. So they were helpful. People were helpful once we asked, but it was kind of like nobody says anything when you go through. And I do know somebody who went quite a far ways down and had to go back to the border and get an FMM. So make sure you get that. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. And for people who don't know what FMM is, that's the um, the visa, the tourist visa, and it lasts for six months. And so that's what you need if you're going by boat or by van. And so I think that's kind of the main thing you have to do with the border. And with our Sprinter, when we brought it down to Sonora, they did inspect it like they did with yours. And they looked at our batteries and they said, do those go with the van? Because I think if you do bring new things into Baja, they could um, charge duty. Um, did you hear anything about duty or did people warn you about that? Yeah. Um, and they asked, I think, when we crossed if we had like, you know, exorbitant amounts of alcohol or food or um, you definitely don't want to bring produce across the border either way going to or from Mexico. So what we did was just kind of empty our refrigerators and just take dry goods. And then as soon as we cross went to a grocery store and filled up. Yeah, totally. There are a lot of grocery stores in Mexico that have lots of food. But if you want specialty items like we eat mostly um, vegetarian and that's kind of hard to do in Mexico if you don't want to eat just beans and lentils all the time. So I tend to bring in, you know, some tofu and some soy curls and some other like weird products that are hard to find. Did you bring anything in particular that, uh, oh, and I tend to find, have a hard time finding really good coffee there. Maybe you have a tip because you're a coffee aficionado like me, but I have the hardest time finding really good coffee in Baja. So I bring tons of coffee from the States, but what are your like specialty items? And if you have any coffee tips, I'd love to know them. Yeah, I'm also vegetarian. Um, so I did bring some you know, fake meat options, uh, plant-based protein options. Um, but I did find that the further south you get, uh, where the more vacation hotspots are, uh, like Todos Santos and Cabo, you can find things like that very easily there. Um, even in La Paz at, at Walmart, they sell Beyond Meat products and things like that. So um, that was good to find out. And now this year, I won't have to bring so much of that stuff. <laughs> um, trying to think if there was anything else that I brought. I don't think so. Pretty much everything else I was able to find or I kind of just adapted my diet to what was there. Um, there's lots of like really good fresh fruits and things that are somewhat different than in the States. So that's nice. Yep. Yep. I found that too with the jicamas, the papayas, like all kinds of things that you don't typically find that are fresh and really good, like tropical fruits that those were my favorite things to get in Mexico. But for me, it was harder to find greens, like especially kale and arugula and stuff. La Paz was easier, but as a boater, going to La Paz is really complicated because you have to go down a very long, narrow channel to get into the marinas, and then you have to figure out how to get to the grocery store. And so often we don't go to La Paz. So we're sort of in these small, random towns that don't have as good of groceries. But when we did go to La Paz, it was fantastic. They do have good stores there. But this year, we might not go there. So I'm thinking, like, what do I have to bring? Yes, I do remember. <laughs> do I need to grow my own arugula on the boat? <laughs> I do remember greens being hard to find. Um I don't, I, well, now I guess I eat more salad than I used to, but, um, I had, I was traveling with a friend who ate spinach every day and he had the hardest time because he couldn't find any greens, um, to go with his breakfast in the morning. So, uh, and then the coffee thing, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a real lack of good coffee. Um, instant coffee is a major thing in Baja. Um, so I wound up buying, I think, cheap coffee at the grocery store for the first month, maybe I was there. Um, and then when you get into the cities, some of them do have more like modern style coffee houses with fancy coffee. Um, and so I bought bags of beans from them. Um, La Paz, definitely Cabo, Todos Santos, Pescadero, sometimes the farmers markets um, in little towns that have expats uh, have little coffee stands. So that's a good place to check for some good coffee. Awesome. That's good advice, too. And yeah, also what's funny is we love IPAs and those are sometimes hard to come by in Baja. So we tend to bring a bunch from Costco. <laughs> and yeah. I know we do mostly Corona, but sometimes you just crave that different flavor. And so that's something else we tend to bring down there. I don't know if you also brought that. Yeah, I didn't bring that, but that is something I will be bringing. Uh, that's so funny. We have very similar uh, diets and drinking habits. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, IPAs were very scarce. Even uh, I think we went to one or two um, breweries down there and the, the IPAs are, are just not the same. Um, but I think I wound up drinking a lot of different things there, uh, similarly to eating different things. Uh, there were a lot of really good like fresh or not fresh, I guess, canned um, cocktails or canned like margaritas and things. Um, 
that were actually fairly low alcohol content and taste really great. So I kind of kept those in the fridge instead of having beers in the fridge. Um, and I've, I've actually still got two left, surprisingly. I kind of stocked the van on the way back because I had been so used to drinking them there that I was like, well, now what am I going to do in the U.S. without these? That is great <laughs> advice. I did see those and I was worried they would be too sweet, so I didn't buy them. So I'll have to give that a try this time. So <laughs> that's fun. Um, let's see. So I'm curious about, so something I get all the time from people and readers of The Wayward Home is, do you feel safe in Mexico? Be careful. The banditos are going to get you. Like, it's not safe down there. I get that all the time. And I'm wondering if if you also, and for me on the boat, and even when we went to towns to get groceries, I always felt safe. I never had any weird experiences in Baja. The people were lovely to me. Um, and yeah, I thought it was fantastic. And I'm just wondering from your perspective, what did you experience and what do people tend to say to you as well? Um, I definitely got that from family members when I said I was driving to Mexico for sure. Um, and sometimes with fellow RVers, if you, if you kind of meet like the retiree crowd, um, they kind of <laughs> have that feeling sometimes. Um, uh, but I had a wonderful experience in Mexico, um, I told, have told everyone I felt safer there than I ever did in my New York City apartment. Uh, it was, everyone there was helpful. Um, if you needed anything, everyone was willing to talk to you. Uh, I never had a single bad thing happen to me. And, you know, after a while, since I was there for three months, I did split up from my caravan and I was by myself for quite a while. Um, I was even parked at one point on a beach by myself for an entire week and no one bothered me ever. Like, I felt completely safe. Oh, that's so good to hear. Yeah. And that's what I've heard from other van lifers who've been down there as well. And that's something I'm happy that my you know listeners and readers can hear from both of us is that we've always felt very safe down there. And um, and in terms of safety, like the roads and like cell phone signal as someone who drove through Baja, like what was that like? Yeah. So the roads are... Um adventurous. <laughs> and so from what I hear from people who have been going for many years, they are great now. Um, and I wouldn't say that they're terrible by any means, but there are spots of the road where it's just like the road is deteriorating and it's just full of potholes. Um, and quite a few sections where it's a very narrow two lane highway. Um, like there's not any shoulder whatsoever. So if you were to bump somebody, you would probably just fly off the road. So it does take a little more concentration uh, driving through it. And there are quite a few stretches of no cell signal. So I would absolutely recommend if you're driving with anyone that you take walkie talkies. Um, that was super helpful for us um, in case anybody needed to stop or needed help with something. We always kept our walkies on on the same channel and we could reach out to anybody, um, anybody around. So that was that was really helpful. Um, there is a new highway connecting, I want to say, Cabo and the West Coast, um, like Todos, from the airport. Um, I think it's a toll road, uh, and it's like brand new and super fast and super beautiful. Uh, but that is not the case with the, the roads up north. So probably from the first half of Baja, Baja, California, as opposed to Baja, California, Sur, which is below, um, those roads are definitely worse uh but there's only one way down so you have to take them yeah and uh, did you spend a lot of time in the north or did you guys kind of kind of drive through the north to get to Baja Sur we went relatively quickly um we stopped in Valle de Guadalupe wine country um and stayed a night there um which I'll, I'll be staying a lot longer on this trip in wine country um just because I'm interested in that area a little more um and then I was with a surfer and there was a record swell. So we did stop on some beaches in the north um, for surfing, uh, which I probably wouldn't stop at on my own, but they were really cute little towns. They were very, very tiny towns where all you do there is surf. There's one taco stand and surf. <laughs> uh, so I would say the north, you know, most people blow through it. There are some cute <laughs> little stops. It's worth it for a day or two. It's probably not where you're going to spend the most of your time. Yeah. And it's probably really remote. We, we, drove, we sailed down the outside of Baja. And we stopped at a lot of those small towns and it had a very remote feeling. I think that was 2020 and 2021. And yeah, there wasn't much going on. And I didn't have Starlink at the time. So I basically had no phone signal almost the entire outside of Baja. And so it felt, I think that contributed to the remoteness. But now that there's Starlink, I think it's a little bit easier to be there. But did you experience like that feeling of it seem wild and remote? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Especially with like how rugged it is. It's just like these rugged rocks and cliffs and 
you're like, wow, I am in the middle of nowhere. Like it's just <laughs> the ocean and rocks. Um, and you know, if you're lucky, there's a taco stand, but probably not. Uh, yeah, it's, it's very remote and we definitely use Starlink quite a bit. Um, there were times when we didn't want to, you know, have to set up the whole Starlink. And so you were dependent on if there was like one business there that might have Wi-Fi and then everybody, all the surfers are connected to it. Everybody who needs to contact home is connected to it. So, yeah. Oh, how funny. And for those long stretches where you didn't really have a lot of phone signal, did you like do anything in particular, like download maps and download campsites beforehand? Yeah, definitely. Uh, that's one of my tips for sure is to download a map. Never rely on Google Maps in Baja, not only for the lack of signal, but just for the lack of uh, clarity in some of the roads. They just, you know, it's not always perfect and up to date. Um, and so, for example, the the main road that we traveled down is newer. And on the map, it was still taking you on the old road, which is not a road you should be driving on anymore. It's not maintained. <laughs> Um, so yes, I, I definitely had downloaded maps. I, I would say carry a paper map just in case, you know, for some reason you don't have access to your phone anyways. Um, it's good to have uh, a paper map and, uh, definitely downloaded a lot of things to listen to. Um, there are big stretches where there's no radio stations or one radio station, and it kind of sounds the same for hours and hours on end. <laughs> That's a good tip to bring something to entertain yourself because that's a pretty long drive um, through northern Baja. At least takes you know maybe a couple days, right? If you were gonna just drive yeah. straight through, yeah, I would say probably two days minimum, but probably yeah, two or three days. Yeah. Wow. So, um, so yeah, let's chat about how to find campsites. Like I know this is very different for you and me because we have cruising guides, and this is what like we go to an anchorage, and this tells us where to go, which anchorages to go. So we read these extensive books to figure out where to stop along the coast of Baja, but I'm sure you have many different methods. And so I'm curious um, how you find places to park your van. Yeah, I definitely use iOverlander a ton. Um, I take it with a grain of salt. Um, some of the posts on there are older and those beaches either don't exist anymore or are private now, or you kind of just got to go with the flow uh, if, you're, if you're using something like that. Um, I would say I actually paid for a lot more campsites in Baja than I normally do. Um, particularly in the popular areas, like Bahia Concepcion is a beautiful bay. It has like three main campgrounds. Um, they're like $20. And while I would not usually pay that in the U S it is absolutely worth it. You are right on the sand on the bay in a beautiful place. So, um, I did find it interesting as far as campgrounds go that they don't take any reservations like in the U S so you would you could call ahead of time and say, do you have a spot for us tomorrow? And they would say, call me back at 9 a.m. tomorrow and I will tell you if there's a spot. Um, and there was one spot, one campground in Loreto that the, the guy said, uh, we don't have room, but I will make room for you. So <laughs> there were no, no actual spots, but crammed us into a corner together. <laughs> um, and so it was just really interesting because you just have to go somewhere not knowing if you have a spot to stay or not. Uh, but the people are so friendly, they, they'll, they'll make it work. <laughs> that sounds very Mexico style to me because things don't always run by the book like they do in the U.S., which tends to be fairly regimented. But when you get to Mexico, it's like, oh, you know, the rules are just everywhere and you never kind of know what to expect. And that's some of the fun of, of Baja as well, I think. So. Yeah, oh, for sure. You just kind of pull up on the beach and set up your camp. And then eventually somebody walks around and says they're collecting money and <laughs> they give you a receipt. So... <laughs> <laughs> That's too funny. So it sounds like you did find some beautiful like beachfront camping. Is there a lot of that in Baja? Oh, yes. Um, I would say probably 90% of where I camped was on the beach in Baja. Um, and it's really gorgeous and ranges from all different things. So like I said, Bahia Concepcion is on the Sea of Cortez side. It is very calm, beautiful place to go out on a kayak or a paddleboard. Um, and then there's on the other side, uh, on the Pacific side, um, like Pescadero, Cerritos, those are big surf beaches, crazy waves, uh, very different sand. It's just totally different. Um, and then um, Cabo Pomo National Park, uh, where a lot of people go diving. Um, that, sand, that beach is actually all rock. Um, it is not sand. So totally different view, um, view there. And yeah, there's just, I mean, it, it, it sounds like boring to some people when you say I'm going to go camp on the beach for three months some people are like I can't do that but they're very different all over the place so it's different experiences all on each side yeah that's really interesting and I'm curious what the like 
what are the campgrounds like? Are they anything like campgrounds in the States where you get like a picnic table and a fire ring and stuff? Or, or what are they like? Uh, but mostly not. Um, some of them, I don't even know if I ever had a picnic table. I don't think I did. Uh, some <laughs> of them on the beach have um, a palapa. Um, and they're usually like an extra $5 if you have a palapa as opposed to not having one. Um, they're nice if you have a group of people and you want to have like a little shady spot or, you know, store some store your like paddle boards and things in there when you're not using them. Um, but we did find that they also are like magnets for bugs, mosquitoes, um, sometimes mice. Uh, so you kind of got to watch a black widows. <laughs> so well, they look beautiful in pictures because you have this beautiful little palm frond palapa next to your van. But, you know, they're not quite as practical <laughs> as they look in pictures. Um, but interesting. So the, the bugs live up in the fronds yeah. sometimes. Yeah. I mean, as it's kind of like a tree. So yeah, yeah, they live, they live there. Um, just something to watch if you have like pets or things. Totally. And do, do they have bathroom facilities and showers? How does that work? Some of them have bathroom facilities and usually they're kind of just like an outhouse, um, just like a pit toilet. They vary on range of cleanliness. Um, I would say always bring your own toilet paper. I don't expect that to ever be there. Uh, some of the campgrounds that are maybe in towns might have a shower. Uh, it's not probably guaranteed to have warm water. Uh, that's just that's kind of like a real luxury in Baja to have a warm shower. First of all, to have a shower, and second of all, to have a warm shower <laughs> is a real luxury. So I would say go in thinking that you're not going to get a warm shower, and then when you do, you'll be very pleasantly surprised. <laughs> So do you recommend um, people bring their own toilet to Baja? Absolutely. Yes. Um, and you don't have to have like an actual toilet or anything fancy. I take a bucket and kitty litter. Uh, it is just easier when you're on the beach in the middle of nowhere. Um, it's not uh, appropriate to bury waste on the beach. And so it just is much easier to use kitty litter and bag it up and throw it away when you leave. Oh, cool. So the way that works is you just, you know, use a bag in, in the bucket and then you add kitty litter, go add more, and then you can use it like a couple times and keep adding that to get rid of the smell. And then when you leave, you just throw it out. That's yeah. kind of how that works. Yep. Right? And I would say that's probably what, what most of people do. Uh, it's just easier. Uh, some people that have composting toilets have said it can be difficult to find like coconut core or things um, for their composting toilets. So if you have that, I would say bring it ahead of time or have enough until you get to somewhere like Cabo that has big enough pet stores that might have that. Right. That's interesting. And um, yeah. And did, did anybody, you know, bring like a portable toilet, like that you have to go into a bathroom and empty or did they not usually do that? I don't think so. I think we had talked to enough people who had been there before and said that finding dump stations was not as easy as you would want it to be and that it, your life would be much simpler if you just brought a bucket. <laughs> I know totally if you had like a big RV with the like black tanks like I don't even know where you would dump that I'm sure they have it somewhere in Baja but since I'm not an RVer I'm not really in tune to that. Yeah I mean I would imagine it would have to be at one of in one of the bigger cities I can't I, I don't think there's any infrastructure for that in in the small towns. Yeah yeah for sure and did you ever stay in like an RV park situation? I think I've seen photos of that where people have like a pool and more facilities. Did you try that or were you mostly doing beach camping? Um, I did. I stayed in um, a campground in Loreto in the city, um, which is actually where I found my dog. Um, and they had they had uh, showers and bathrooms and they had a washing machine, but it was broken, <laughs> which is also like don't don't depend on that. <laughs> um, and I stayed at another one uh, in La Paz, um, which was quite interesting. I'll have to send you a picture of it sometime. They, um, it was one of those situations where you call ahead and they said, we promise we'll fit you in. But it was like, I mean, a jigsaw puzzle. Like I had to, they, three people had to leave and I had to back in and, you know. um, and they had showers and I think a communal kitchen. Um, I didn't stay anywhere that had a pool. The only place I even saw a pool at a campground, I want to say, was in San Felipe. Uh, and because San Felipe is so close to the U.S., it's always it's like a often a first stop for people when they cross the border. because It's just a few hours. Um, because of that, the prices are really high uh, because some people might only go as far as San Felipe. Um, and so we opted to stay at a very cheap place that didn't have any amenities like that. But the pool campsites were, I want to say, like 40 or $50 US. 
Yeah. Yeah. I could see that because in Puerto Penasco, you also have a lot of people that cross the border and don't go any further. And there's beautiful beach campgrounds there, but I think they're like at least 50 a night. And so they're more catering to the people who aren't really going deep into Mexico. And what's funny when you say that, similar to the marinas in Baja are insanely expensive. They're like, um, you know, similar to the U.S., if not more. Like there's one marina that we went to south of Loreto called um, Puerto Escondido Marina, and it's beautiful. But if you want to stay on the docks, it's like a hundred bucks a night. And I'm like, what? Like, this is so expensive, but you have to book a longer stay for it to be cheaper. But still, I was pretty shocked by, you know, just how much, the, but, but they're probably gouging the you know, Americans and Canadians that come down just by making those prices, it's their audience, you know, so they can get away with it. <laughs> but I thought that was really interesting. I believe it might be that marina. It sounds familiar. Um, there's, there was a beach campsite that we stayed at. And from there, you could hike a couple of miles and and get to the marina and we had heard a lot of people would uh sneak into the showers there because they weren't manned but there were showers there. <laughs> so people were saying if you want to hike that far yes. you can get a free shower <laughs> yes and i've taken a lot of showers there and they're the nicest showers i've found in baja they actually use like fancy products really hot water like it's really awesome and there's a restaurant there that's a beautiful with a view of the huge sierra i think they're the sierra madres but these huge mountains back there and you can get a pizza out of the wood-fired uh, pizza grill so it's kind of like a little taste of fanciness in the middle of nowhere but the prices reflect that yeah absolutely <laughs> so, yeah if you if you if you have a chance to check it out yeah do the hike <laughs> so yeah um, what were some of your favorite areas of Baja that you're going to go back again this year? Um, well, I, like I said before, Valle de Guadalupe is wine country. Uh, it is just stunning. It's mountainous, uh, beautiful. Um, and there are several wineries that will let you park overnight. Um, if, you know, if you buy wine from them, uh, we went to one of the biggest wineries, which is on Harvest Host. Um, but you don't have to be on Harvest Host to stay there. And, their wine is really good and incredibly cheap. I want to say like $6 for a really good bottle of wine. Uh, yes. So the tasting was like a normal tasting price. It was like $20 or something to do the tasting, but the bottles were just incredibly cheap. Uh, I know some people bought cases of them to keep with them for the time they were in Baja. And um, yeah, that's a really great area. Um, there are some more expensive and more fancy wineries as well. Um, it's kind of just depending on your taste. Uh, they also have like, you know, luxury hotels there and you can sleep in wine barrels and do all those kinds of things if you're interested in that. Um, uh, I think I'm going to be there actually for Christmas this year. So I might, we might do a hotel or something just for something, something to splurge on for the holidays. Uh, and then, yeah, I've heard great things about that place, but I haven't Yeah, been. it's beautiful. Um, I know I have a friend who, who lives in San Diego who actually goes down there for just, you know, for weekends and things like that. So, um, Another place I want to go back to for sure is um, the beaches outside of La Paz. Um, some of them are just absolutely stunning. And um, Tecalote is a, one of the popular ones. It gets incredibly crowded, especially during Escapar, um, which is a, a van gathering. Um, and I mean, there's, there was probably over a thousand vehicles there um, for the event last year. Yeah. Um, Playa Balandra is one of wow. the, has been rated one of the most beautiful beaches in the world. Um, you cannot camp at it, but you can visit and they kind of limit your visit to half a day. I believe you can either go in the morning and then they clear out the beach and bring in the afternoon crew or vice versa. Um, and Pichu Lingue, which you may have gone to in your sailboat uh, because we see lots of sailboats anchored out there. Um, it's beautiful. Um, and my favorite place probably uh is somewhere along the <laughs> East Cape. So between like Cabo Pomo National Park and San Jose del Cabo, there's a stretch of beach, which is starting to be developed, but it's still relatively undeveloped. So there's nothing for several hours. Um, so if you stock up your van, you have water and you have everything you need, you can kind of go out there and just plant yourself for a while. So um, I did that for a while and just, it was, an incredible experience to wake up in the morning and there would be whales breaching like right you could see them right out cool. your door and it, like things I never thought possible when I moved into a van I was like this this is incredible that's really cool that you could see that from the beach too because that's one of the joys of being in the sailboat 
anchored at these places is you just have this front row seat to all this wildlife. And you're right, it does come into the bays because we've had you know, whales, dolphins, uh, stingrays, you know, I don't know if you've seen the the mobula rays leaping out of the water, but it's just, it's really interesting. The wildlife you see down there, it's very populated with wildlife. And I know a lot of it's actually gone because most of the shark population is gone. A lot of it's overfished. We had a hard time even catching a fish last year, but there's still a lot of yeah. cool wildlife to see. <laughs> so it's one of my favorite parts. <laughs> yeah, I, there was way more wildlife yeah. than I had ever expected um i'd heard people talk about you know going on the whale watching boats and things like that um but i I didn't realize from the beach how much you could see uh pretty much every night and every morning on the beach you could see whales um on both sides so there were humpback whales and gray whales um, because it is migration season and calving season um and so uh, also you could see lots of babies which was incredible that's so cool. Um, have you heard of the, there's a little bay that's on the um, Pacific side, Ignacio, maybe, where you can go and take a boat out to be with the humpbacks and they're young. Did you do that? Or are you thinking of doing that this year? Yeah. So we, uh, because I was with a group that went down in January, we were early. So we stopped um, just outside of Guerrero Negro. Um, the bay is called Ojo de Libre. Um, and we went on a boat and we saw several whales because they were just starting to come in. Um, But the uh, captain said that there were probably somewhere around like, I think, 30 or 40 whales at that time. And there are like 2,500 that come in season. So like we were like right at the beginning of it. Um, I know that people who were going back up around end of February ish kind of got like the best show. Um, And I've seen all of their pictures and videos like the whales come right up to the boat. They're like they like want to be petted like puppies. (laughs) Like they are. Like, I guess they're very, very interactive. Um, and from my experience, at least, like the, the boat tour company was pretty ethical. Like they didn't do anything to bring the whales to them. They kind of just exist and, and come up on their own. That's incredible. That's something I would like to do sometime, which is a little bit harder on the boat because you have to find somewhere to dock it and then you got to get a car and drive over there. So it's easier for you in the van. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, for sure. And like that, um, that place, I want to say it was called Mario's. I can't quite remember, but um, they have camping. There's a campground on site. um, So you can camp there and then get up and do like the early morning uh, boat tour um, and go out and see the whales. Or I mean, you could stay as long as you want, but that's ideally what you would do is, you know, go on the morning one before it gets too crowded and you're fighting for space on a boat. Um, But the camping was also very affordable there. I want to say it was like maybe $10 or something. um, And then you can go out right in the morning. Very cool. Um, Fantastic. There's just so many places to explore in Baja. And you went with a group last year. So are you planning a solo trip this year? Are you meeting people or how is that working? So I'm going to cross the border um, with two friends. Uh, Well, right now it's two friends. We don't know. There might be more people that join us. Um, And we are going to do the holidays together. um, And then kind of it's up in the air. Um, I'm pretty used to traveling by myself. So once I get to a certain point, I kind of feel like We'll probably split up and then meet back up. And that's just kind of how we all travel in general. So it makes sense to do the same in Baja. Um, I think crossing the border, you can absolutely cross the border by yourself. It's perfectly safe. Uh, But I think a lot of us just feel comfortable crossing the border together, you know, in case something happens, like somebody knows where you are. You know, we have uh, tabs on each other. um, And that those first couple of days through uh, the north part of Baja where there isn't anything and there isn't cell signal, it just is easier to do with other people. Yeah, that makes total sense. Cause yeah, there's way more in Baja Sur towns and people and cell signal. So it feels a little less remote and better to be on your own, I'm sure. So um I wanted to ask you about gear, like essential gear you think people should bring or what you wish you had, you know, you didn't have, but what you're bringing this year. Anything you can recommend about gear? Yes, definitely. Um so walkie-talkies is the number one. So I would say if you don't get anything else, get walkie-talkies so that you can communicate with people when you don't have cell signal, because that's going to be frequent that you don't have cell signal. Um, second, I would say get some sort of traction boards, something to get yourself out when you get stuck. Um, I got stuck a couple of times, one in the sand, one in the rocks and sand. Um, and actually that time I wound up having to get pulled out by a friend. So <laughs> that was a little bit ridiculous but um the the time I got stuck in the sand I was by myself and I have go treads um which I highly recommend they take up hardly any space they fold up very small um they can also be used as leveling blocks uh which is like I love things that work more than one function in the van um so 
go treads are like my my absolute favorite gear item I have. Uh, I have used them to get out of sand many times. Um, they're easy to use on your own. And um, I would say mud is the only thing they're not great at. And there's not really going to be mud in Baja. So for Baja, they are a must. Um, and they just take up so much less space than those giant traction boards when you have such limited room in your van. Uh, I would say two other things that I would recommend are, um, these are like not must-haves, but nice-to-haves. Uh, something to air down your tires with. Um, so you, if you have like the presets that you can just air down your tires quickly, um, and then a compressor to put air back in your tires, it just makes it so much easier to drive on sand or on some of like the really, really rocky areas. Uh, it, it's just a lot nicer. I had a compressor with me, but not the air down tool. So I was able to borrow that from a friend. And I think I will definitely have my own this year. Uh, and I'll probably have even a better compressor because my compressor took quite a while to air my tires back up. But I mean, if you have time, you don't need anything fancy. And even as slow as mine was, I also lent it to other people. So uh, that's definitely something I would bring. Yeah, that's a great tip. Um, yeah. Did you bring like stuff to go in the water with? Or are you bringing that this year? Um, so I bought a snorkel, which is quite funny because I don't like fish. Um, and I don't, I probably didn't even really anticipate going snorkeling, but I brought one. Um, I would say if you have one, bring one. If you plan on snorkeling, bring that stuff. You can buy it there, but it's going to be at a premium because, you know, everyone needs one. Um, and what I didn't know is that if you plan on swimming a lot or surfing or doing anything in the water, you probably want a wetsuit. <laughs> uh the water is much colder than I anticipated. Uh, it's not it's not very warm and you don't want to be in it very long if you don't have a wetsuit on. So <laughs> if you plan on swimming or doing anything in the water, definitely bring a wetsuit because they are more difficult to find there for sure. Definitely. That's great advice because sometimes when we've been on the boat in the winter or even in March when we went last year, the water was very cold and I did wear a 3-2 wetsuit for a long time. But once we reached, we were in the water actually way longer than I would recommend. We were there until about mid-June and it was so hot. And But the water got up, was about 85 by the time we left. So by May and June, it's really warm. And I was just swimming everywhere with no wetsuit. Wow. And it was just fantastic for snorkeling and swimming. But I know. So if you want warm water, it's definitely May or June or September or October, but in the winter, it is cold and we definitely wear wetsuits all the time. But yeah, it depends on kind of what time of year you're in the sea because the water, I think in the summer, it gets up to like 90 there because I have some boater friends who stay all summer. I don't know how they do it, but the water <laughs> gets really warm, but the air is also really hot and that makes it hard to sleep, especially if you're, I mean, in a van, you know, you have even a smaller space in the boat and I imagine it gets even hotter <laughs> unless you have a way to run an AC unit. Um, so I don't think a lot of van lifers go in somewhere. I like, I don't want to be there on the boat e either. <laughs> no, I was just thinking that. I was thinking that by the time I left uh, at the end of March, my like it was so hot in the van already. It was like 90 degrees on the East Cape when I was uh, deciding that I needed to leave. It was just kind of getting to be unbearable already. And it was only March. Yeah. Um, so I cannot imagine being there uh, in June or something other month no. that's hotter than that. Uh, yeah, it was a lot. <laughs> no, I know. And that's something we noticed with the boat um, as well as when we were out at anchor, we got more breezes off the water and the water there was cooler, like maybe 70. But then when we'd walk to the beach and we'd walk to where some of the vans and the truck campers were, we're like, oh my gosh, it's hot because the sand gets hot. It just makes, you know, you get that land heat coming up. And so it is a warmer experience, I think, if you're in the van and you have to leave a little earlier. So yeah. <laughs> something for people to keep in mind. All right. So Brooke, you have some more tips to share with people thinking of making the journey this year. Um, yeah. What other advice do you have? So when you are going to cross the border by land uh, in a vehicle, you have to have Mexican auto insurance. Um, your U.S. policy does not cover you driving in Mexico. Um, and so you'll need to purchase a policy. Uh, you can typically purchase like 10 days, a month, three months, six months. Um, I think I did a six month policy um, for the valuation I put on my van and, you know, what I thought I needed. I think it cost me like $300 for six months, something like that. Um, there are definitely higher plans, lower plans. Um, search around. Baja Bound is a company that a lot of people go with. It's very um, 
gringo friendly. <laughs> uh, you can also, though, search around and find cheaper rates uh, with smaller companies. I used Lewis and Lewis, uh, and that's who I'm going to use again. Um, they had by far the best rate for what I was looking for. Uh, so that's what I would recommend there. Uh, if you have any pets, you need to have proof of all of their uh, vaccinations. Um, and you need, uh, I would say, print out paper copies to have with you. Um, and you'll also be asked for your vehicle registration when you cross the border. So make sure that you have that with you. Uh, so those are my, my main things. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you remembered to mention about insurance, because even when we bring our van to Puerto Penasco to work on the boat, we still have to have insurance, you know, either whether it's that our old Astro or the newer Sprinter. Yeah, the U.S. insurance does not work. <laughs> so that's so important that you brought that up. So thank you for remembering that tip. <laughs> uh, it, it also, depending on how long you're going to go for, I have heard people say that they have they've been able to like freeze their U.S. policy so that they are not making payments on their U.S. policy when they're not using it. So contact your company and, you know, see if there's like pause that you can put on it while you're, if you're going to be gone for several months. Yeah, that's also a great advice. So cool. Well, yeah, thanks for sharing all this amazing information. I hope more inspires more people to uh, make the trek and, and you're going to be posting about it, I'm sure on your Instagram account. So let people know like where to come follow you. Sure. My Instagram account is the name of my van. Uh, it's named Prime, the Pro Master. Uh, and you can see my rescue dog that I picked up while I was in Baja last winter. Uh, he's going to be going back to his hometown and see if he remembers anything. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah. I'll make sure to, you know, link to your social media in the show notes and yeah. And hopefully we'll run into each other at some point down there. You know, it's hard to make the boat and the van be at the same place at the same time, but you never know. <laughs> we'll be in touch and yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. I hope you have another great season in there and I'm excited to follow your updates. Thanks for having me. Well, you can follow Brooke's adventures on her Instagram account. You'll find that link below in the show notes. And I'll be posting about boat life from my account, which is at The Wayward Home. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Wayward Home podcast. Remember to like, subscribe, and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps me reach more people who are interested in nomadic living. I'll see you next time, and thanks for tuning in. Are you wanting to live the van life but have no idea where to start? Well, I can help you out. My free Van Life Starter Kit gives you specs and measurements of 10 popular vans, plus build-out ideas, buying tips, remote work ideas, and where to find free campsites. To get your free Van Life Starter Kit, just go to thewaywardhome.com forward slash vanlife. That's thewaywardhome.com forward slash vanlife.